Join me in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter number 13. Uh, we would say another welcome to those of you that might have missed the first one. We are in the middle. We're actually towards the end of a series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we have been discussing these things for seven or eight weeks now. And I have really longed to get to the text and the message that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, the name of the message is Timing is Everything. Timing is everything. And when it comes to the debate on the question of whether or not the gifts of the Holy Spirit are operative today, we've covered so much of that that I can't rehash it to, uh, this morning for the sake of time. But the argument, I guess, the debate, if we want to use a more civil word, is between those that believe the gifts ceased around the end of the first century and those that believe know the gifts continue on today. And there's a lot of middle ground, but ultimately let me make this statement to set kind of the table because this is a theological issue. It's not an issue of preference. It's not an issue of denominational affiliation. This is a theological issue. Because when we have a group of Christians that loves Jesus Christ and has committed their lives to Christ, and they're serving Christ, and they love the word of God, and they advance the kingdom, and they know that they are not their own, but are bought with a price, and yet they believe that the gifts have ceased. And then you have, on the other hand, a group of people who have that same description of loving Christ and loving the word and advancing the kingdom, and yet they believe the gifts have continued on to this very day. Both groups cannot be right. Somebody is right on this issue and somebody is wrong. Now, we, we, we live in a country where we don't like to talk about stuff like that. We, we want everybody to be right. Well, that's part of the problem with the country, and we don't want that infiltrating the church. When it comes to theological issues, we must get our theology from God's word. And so my desire in this series has been to ask the very simple question, what do the scriptures say? And as I do that, I recognize that there are great Christians who disagree with me and my position that the gifts continue on to this day. Somebody asked me right before the service, Jeff, when are you going to talk about those gifts that haven't continued? And I said, I'm not. The gifts have continued. That is my position. That does not validate every expression of the gifts that we see in the church today. It's not to say that everything that is attributed to the Holy Spirit actually comes from the Holy Spirit, but the gifts as given in Scripture, it is my theological conviction that they continue on today. But the Bible does make it difficult for us because in, in this sense, there's a statement that we're going to read this morning and it simply says this, it tells us that the gifts will cease someday. The question is not if the gifts cease, the Scriptures are very clear that the gifts will cease. The issue is when. And that's why I've called today's message, Timing is Everything. And in honor of the reading of the word, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're physically able. And let me read verses 8 through 12, verses that we have touched on already, but verses that I want to cover this morning. And if time permits, we'll go to Acts 2 and Ephesians 4 as I make a biblical case why I believe that the gifts continue on to this very present day. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. I like to preach. That's just kind of my sweet spot. Um, I enjoy teaching equally, but when I'm in here with you and when we've magnified Jesus and sung and some of you Bapticostals were shouting and praising and just, just giving God the glory, it kind of just stirs me. And so when I get up here in, in moments like that where I'm, I'm stirred both spiritually and, and mentally and, and even physically and emotionally, um, it just makes me want to kind of ditch the outline and just celebrate. But our purposes this morning aren't served well by that. 
Because this is a theological issue, and in this series, it's the key theological issue. This is where we look to the scriptures and say, what do the scriptures say about either the continuance or the termination of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And so I'm going to slow down. I may even stay anchored back here just so I stay on point this morning. But I pray that in the midst of my calm approach, you aren't lulled into a dullness because you need to be sharp to receive this. I prayed that I'd teach it well. You need to be praying that you'll be able to hear it well this morning. We're going to go to three passages if time allows. We're definitely going to this first one to begin. And I want to speak on what Paul taught Corinth about the ceasing of the gifts. Were it not for 1 Corinthians 13, 8, and 9, there would be no debate at all about whether or not the gifts of the Holy Spirit continue. Nobody would ever have thought that the gifts stopped had there not been this statement in these verses that we're going to read. It is in the Bible, and therefore it must own our our allegiance to inspect and understand what Paul was communicating to Corinth about the ceasing of the gifts. Let's just start. I like to start in easy to understand statements. Verse number eight, this is what Paul taught Corinth. Spiritual gifts will eventually cease. Now, he's writing 2,000 years ago, and he's talking to a group of people who are incredibly gifted. He made that statement in chapter number one, but they're also incredibly immature. And the easiest thing to do would be to tell the people, just stop using the gifts. You're making a mess of it. But he never says that. In fact, he tells them to pursue more gifts, to pursue and eagerly desire and sincerely desire and earnestly desire the gifts. But he does mention that they're going to stop one day. So we know automatically that Paul says, although love will never end, he says that right there in verse number eight, love is superior to spiritual gifts and that love goes on throughout the eternal ages. That is the theme of the ages, the glory of God and the love of God towards those of us that have been redeemed. But as for prophecies, the Bible is very clear that prophetic gifting and the prophecies that come from them, they will stop, they will pass away. As for tongues, which we're going to be talking about, Lord willing, next week and the week after, they will cease. They'll stop. So we're told also, as for knowledge, it's going to pass away. And I believe what Paul's referring there uh, to there, to be fair, is not just simply knowing things, but the gift of supernatural knowledge, the gift of knowledge, the word of knowledge. So we're told right off the bat that Paul is saying love goes on forever. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And in comparison to love, I want you to know, Paul says, that your prophetic gifting won't be forever. Your gift of tongues and by proxy interpretation of tongues, the the word of knowledge, and I actually believe we're safe to say that all of the gifts Paul is representing here with three of them, he's saying that's going to stop, it's going to vanish. Those of you that were raised maybe in a charismatic Pentecostal background, and you you don't know what the big deal is. You're saying, Jeff, why are you taking eight weeks to talk about this? It's because the scriptures clearly say that the gifts are going to come to a stopping point, and I was trained, and so are most of the people in this church, to believe that that stopping point was somewhere around the end of the first century when one or two events happened. One, some would say, and this is a in my opinion, a very poor argument, that with the closing of the canon of Scripture, the gifts, the supernatural gifts were no longer needed, therefore they just passed off the scene. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not say it. We'll cover the verses in a minute that people use to say that it says it. It doesn't. And the other one is, well, when the apostles, the original apostles passed off the scene, the supernatural gifting was taken away, and instead of apostles and prophets operating, you now have pastors and shepherds and teachers operating who do not need those gifts. And so it is a logical argument, but we are not trying to make a logical argument when defining doctrine. It must be a theological argument. It can't be about our best reasoning. It has to be what does the scripture say? And so we find out that Paul says, hey, everybody, the gifts are temporary. And so let's go ahead and own that. The gifts are temporary. Okay, Paul, when do they end? That's the rest of this message. Spiritual gifts, not only can we say that they'll eventually cease, but verse number nine, spiritual gifts are valuable, but even at their best, they are incomplete. Watch what the word of God says. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, here we go, the partial will pass away. There's the crux of the matter. 
Here we are. We have finally made it after seven weeks to spend some time speaking here. The Bible tells us when that, the, when the gifts will pass away. They are referred to as being incomplete or partial. We're specifically told here tongues and prophecies and knowledge. And then we're told again in verse number nine that uh, prophecy and, and knowledge will pass away, knowing in part and prophesying in part. But when the perfect comes, there it is. We can know when the gifts pass off the scene. It is when the perfect or, uh, yeah, the perfect comes that the partial will pass away. So now we've burrowed down further. Now we need to answer to the question, what's the perfect? Well, and and again, I I hear many of you crying out, the perfect is Jesus. But, But understand that there are great Christians who love Jesus equally who would disagree with you on that. And so to many, it would be simple, it would make sense, but it is not as simple. It is in the word, I will grant you that, but we are operating not only needing to pursue what is true, but in order to pursue what is true, we've had a lot of baggage placed on us. We gotta shake free of what isn't true. Because let me tell you what I was trained in. Man, I said I was just gonna teach, but I'm gonna have to incorporate a little preaching. I was taught that the perfect was God's word. I I was taught that, The only thing that is perfect in the world today is the completed word of God. And therefore, because we now have our Bibles, which is perfect, gives us all things pertaining to to, uh, godliness and life, then we don't need what what I was told were the sign gifts back in the day. And so it made sense. I was like, yeah, we've got the word. We don't need tongues. We don't need prophecy. We don't need word of knowledge. We don't need word of wisdom. We don't even need healing. And I was taught a whole host of things. And quite frankly, that's the teaching that got to me first. And because it got to me first, it burrowed in with nothing stopping it, and it became an accepted doctrine to me. Now as I read, I I say to myself, why did they say that? Listen, I'm not being ugly. I'm giving you my testimony. Why did, how did they so easily just say that which is perfect is the word of God? Friends, do you realize with me that if that's true, that Paul was referring to the word of God, he would have had to foresee a completed canon of scripture. And not only would he have to foresee it as vaguely as he apparently would be referencing it here, he he would have to assume that the Corinthians would know he's, he's talking about the completed canon of scripture, which there's no way they could have known. And so when we look at the partial, it's describing a state of incompleteness. It's characterized by these gifts. We know in part, we prophesy in part. Please remember that. When we're talking about spiritual gifts, the exercise of them, even at their most heightened, perfect state, still involves the human element. It still involves the potential for those gifts, those valid gifts to be used in ways that are not always honoring to the Lord. And so when you have a person that might be gifted for the gifting and the calling of God is without repentance, they may have a gift, but if they're not walking in the spirit or under the yoke of the spirit, if they are taking their gift and they're using it outside of love as the beginning of this chapter talked about, then there is the potential risk. And even prophecy, though in the Old Testament, remember with me, when an Old Testament prophet rose up, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, when they rose up and they inscripturated their prophecies, God spoke directly through the prophet and what was said was said. And if that prophecy did not come true by Moses' law, that prophet could be stoned. Look at how it's described differently in the New Testament. It's not a template. It is described as being in part. And we're going to get to prophecy as its own gift here in a couple of uh, weeks. But, But the point being here is this, the state of the gifts are very valuable, but they're incomplete. That's why Jesus didn't commission his church to go out and impart gifts. That's not the great commission. Our worship services are not structured so everybody can show what gift that they have. Uh, As we mature in Christ, the maturing in Christ is not necessarily evidenced by this gift or that gift or any gift. And so what happens in the other side of the argument where cessationism says that the gifts have stopped altogether, the other side of the argument says, no, gifts are, that's what everything's about. There's certain fringe areas that say, if you don't pray in tongues or speak in tongues, you're not even saved. And my friends, I would say, let's, let's be reasonable and say, what do the scriptures say? Because both of those extremes are not representative of, of what the Bible says about gifts. 
Spiritual gifts are valuable but incomplete. Move down. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, and it's not by deception, it's for time. I'm actually skipping verses 10 and 11. We can talk about, excuse me, verse, uh, verse number 11 where Paul talks about speaking as a child and so on and so on. We're going to actually come back to that, I think, next week. But for today, look in verse 12. Spiritual gifts will be replaced by fullness and completion. Watch this. Paul's going to say, here's what's going on now. But when the perfect comes, that's the then, he's already referenced it. When the perfect comes, here's how things will be. Now we see through a mirror dimly. But then, when? Well, the antecedent is when the uh, perfect comes. So Paul is now about to describe when the perfect comes, which also is the time where the partial passes away. So this is the descriptor of the time where that which is partial has passed away because that which is full has come or complete has come. Now we see through a mirror dimly. We know in part. We prophesy in part. Now we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now here we have our Bible describing the time period when the partial passes away, where the gifts pass away, and the complete or the fullness or the perfect has come. So let's say, or let's see what the scriptures are describing here. It says when that occurs, it will be a time described as face to face. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, I love my Bible. I'm in my Bible all the time. I'm sure some of you may study your Bible more than me, but nobody wants to study his or her Bible more than me. I am a word man, but I can tell you this. I have read of God. I have learned of God. I've experienced the presence of God. I've discerned God. I've committed my will to obey God, and I've done that through a study of the word. But that Bible, I've never opened it and been ushered into a face-to-face meeting with him. Matter of fact, when we see this Greek phrase here, and it's translated face-to-face in the English version, the ESV, in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, when you see this phrase or a similar phrase, it almost always is characterizing a theophany, a person encountering a manifest presence of God invisible. The invisible God becomes visible. And so it is indicating being in the actual presence, the visible presence of God. I love my Bible, but my Bible has not ushered that in. Brothers, sisters, follow with me. It says also when the gifts pass, when the partial passes away, when the perfect comes, I will know fully. Now, I love my Bible again, but I I want to tell you, whether it's the Bible being completed or the apostles passing off the scene, do you know anybody in the body of Christ with a sound mind that could stand up and say, I know everything? But do you realize that one day all mysteries will be solved? All spiritual questions will be answered? All of the ways of God which are mysterious and baffling to us at times now here will then be fully exposed? The Bible says we will know fully even as we've been known. In other words, it's referring to the knowledge of God of us. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying that these gifts will be replaced by a fullness and a completion. But the Bible, the completing of the canon of Scripture, where all the books of the Bible were composed, recognized, and the council said, this is God's word, none of that ushered us into a face-to-face meeting. None of that gave us full knowledge. None of it did. Nor did the passing off the scene of the apostles. That we're talking about, it says even being fully known, it's talking about an unhindered, full clarity of knowledge. And none of us has that yet. And yet the Bible says that the gifts don't pass away until that happens. Now the case gets stronger. We're going to move out of 1 Corinthians in a few moments. Let me give you one little thing from chapter number one. These verses will be up on my next point. Spiritual gifts last until Christ is revealed. That is my summary statement. This is not the best verse for that, but I just want to show you, Paul seems to hint at it in chapter one. In every way, he writes to Corinthians, you were enriched in him, in Christ, in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end. 
guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now follow with me here. Again, that's not, I would never use that, those verses alone to state my case, but Paul is writing and he's not trying to win an argument. He's certainly not solving debate. He is giving apostolic theology. He's giving God's word. And in the first chapter, he says to the Corinthians, you're not coming behind in any gift. And he connects the ongoing use and expectation and the use of the gifts all the way up to the point until the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we have in chapter 13, the disclosure that the gifts are in operation until that which is perfect has come. Brothers and sisters, that which is perfect must refer based on the description of the return of Jesus Christ and the state of being that follows after his return. It is not till he returns that we have the final face-and-face counter that opens us up to all knowledge to where we know even as we are known. We can study the Bible all we want, but none of us could say that the completed canon of Scripture gives us full and perfect knowledge yet. And it certainly does not bring us into a face-to-face meeting. Now listen, I've had some really intense encounters with God, but I've never seen them. I have never had, and some of y'all are going to be relieved to hear me confess that. No, I have never seen Jesus. I've never seen the Lord. I haven't. But his presence has been so real at times in my life where I knew he was in the room. By the way, just because it says I'm where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. That's great. That's omnipresence. But I'm talking about the presiding presence of God, where God's not just simply in the room, but he's up to something really good. And I've had those moments, but I've never seen them face to face. But let me just throw something at you. I'm going to. I'm going to see the Son of God face to face with glorified eyes. I will see him in his glory. I'll fall down at my feet. You'll be falling down with me, but we will see him. He is sitting bodily on a throne in heaven, the glorified body. The angel said that, I'm preaching, here we go. The angel said that he would leave, and as we saw him leave, or as they saw him leave, he will come again in like manner. So we'll see him in his body. We'll see him. And when we see him, the perfect knowledge would come. John wrote in his first epistle, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so there's a transformation. And at that point, you don't need any gifts. Why? Because gifts are given to build up the body of Christ. There won't be any building necessary when we are glorified with him. And until then, we must have the gifts to build up one another. You can turn to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 14 through 21. Peter, in his Pentecost sermon, indicated that that moment, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit thundered in, that was the inauguration of a very specific time period. And there are prophecies attached that describe that time period all the way up until the return of Christ. And so let's look at this and then let's parse out these verses. Acts 2, 14, I believe they'll be up on the slides too. Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them. This is after the Holy Spirit came. This is after all people heard them speaking in their own languages. It was a beautiful chaos that morning. But Peter now speaks in the native language. And he says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And now he's quoting Joel chapter 2. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Say all flesh with me. All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now watch this. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Same prophecy, same time period being described. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke. 
The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so we're going to go 800 years before the day of Pentecost. There's a Hebrew prophet named Joel who is writing down God's prophecy in Revelation. He's inscripturating it. He's writing it down. It becomes part of the body of the Bible, the canon of scripture, the Hebrew Bible, which is part of ours too. And it is known as the book of Joel. And in Joel chapter two, Joel's prophecy is a revelation from God that in the last days, God was going to do a work that had not been done before. That in the last days, the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, was going to be poured out in such a way that it would change the characterization of that age. And we're given some of the identifying marks of that. And so let's walk through this together again. This prophecy from Joel 2 clearly began at Pentecost. That's in verse 16. This is, Peter said, this, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit, the praying and prophesying in tongues, and every man heard them in their own language. Peter said, this is the prophecy. It's begun. It was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost. So we don't have any way to wonder, did it really happen then? The Bible, this, you'd have to hire a group of attorneys to confuse you on this, amen? Sorry, Jeremy, wherever you are, but Bill, you too. But this is clear. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Okay, well, let's move further. The details of this prophecy are evidenced all throughout the New Testament. It's everywhere throughout the New Testament. Outpourings, multiple. You have the Jews here on the day of Pentecost, and you're going to have the Gentiles and the Samaritans later, and then you're going to have multiple occasions where people are filled with the Spirit and, and, and anointed by the Spirit and stand up in the Spirit and minister in the Spirit. It's everywhere throughout the New Testament. And we find that there are prophecies. First Thessalonians 5, Paul is writing, he's like, he had to tell him, don't despise prophecies. I'm going to deal with that in a couple of weeks, so let me discipline myself not to go there today. Visions and dreams. Why am I bringing all this up? This is what Peter said would characterize this time period which began at Pentecost. And we clearly clearly see it evidenced in Scripture. You've got prophecies. You've got dreams. You've got visions. You've got all sorts of supernatural things that are going on, but the ones that are specifically mentioned in the book of Joel are clearly evidenced in our New Testament, primarily in the book of Acts, but not only in the book of Acts. So why am I saying that? Well, I'm just establishing the fact that not only did Peter say that that time began, what what Joel prophesied would characterize that time period also is inscripturated. It's there in the Bible. You have to willingly, willfully close your eyes and shut your Bible to pretend that this supernatural, awesome move of God didn't occur. Now, again, we're not really debating that. We're trying to answer the question, yeah, but when did it stop? Let's look at the rest of the prophecy. Because remember, this is one prophecy. Peter's giving one prophetic pronouncement that what happened on Pentecost inaugurated the time period that Joel prophesied about. So the details of this prophecy, watch this, verses 19 through 21, the details of this prophecy have not been entirely fulfilled. What hasn't been fulfilled, Jeff? Well, look in verse number 19. Wonders in heavens above, signs on the earth below, they're described as blood, fire, vapor of smoke, the sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood, and that all is going to occur in the same prophetic time that Joel was pronouncing and that Peter was saying, it's here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a very reasonable question. Is there anything in the Bible or in history that says the back end of this prophecy has all taken place? It hasn't. The sun hasn't been shining much in Atlanta lately, but it's still up there. Now, we have had this interesting occurrence of the blood red moons. That'll get you scratching your head and wondering. Or Walker prayed wisely earlier today. He talked about the coming of the Lord drawing nigh. I do feel like we're close. But this prophecy hasn't been completed. These details have not yet happened. Therefore, how can we say that the entire prophecy has come to an end? How can we pick portions of the prophecy? How can we say, yeah, the the gift of prophecy, that which is partial, the tongues, the outpouring of the spirit, the dreams, the vision, all of the prophecy. How can we say theologically, biblically, that all of it is complete when clearly the back end of that one prophecy has not been done? 
It's a, a premature declaration that says, yeah, it's all done with. Well, I, I have a time out. Inquiring minds want to know. And I ask my cessationist friends, what about the back half of what Peter said on the day of Pentecost? When did that occur? Do you see what I'm saying? By the way, if, if, if you struggle with that, nobody's going to debate verse number 21. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did that come to an end yet? So we have to look at the scripture in the way that it is given. Peter wasn't parsing out a prophecy in a way that allows us to say, yeah, we're just going to ignore the back end of it, even though it hasn't happened. That prophecy was completed at the end of the first century. Now, again, I would not make this a standalone argument, but I I do want to say this. The biggest issue I have with my former position of cessationism is that I had to do relentless work to make that straw man stand up. I had to pick a verse from over here. I had to import it over here. I had to slightly augment the way this verse was interpreted and attach it. I had to rain down a little wishful thinking that nobody would ask any of the difficult questions, which I am now asking all of us. Because the the ramifications of getting this wrong are not small. It's it's not a a doctrinal issue that I believe has to divide Christians, but it has a massive practical ramification. If we say that these gifts have passed off the scene, and just for argument's sake, they haven't, that means there are gifts that are available that God has given to people that we're telling them they can't use. What work of New Kingdom, New Testament, or Kingdom, New Testament work, what work is left undone because people are being told they don't have the gifts to build up the body of Christ in that way? So it is an important issue. It's not one I would divide fellowship over with with anybody. However, I'm also not going to pretend that the Bible says other than what it says. So, Jeff, is there anything else to help us? Let me give you a, what I call a sound scriptural conclusion. Since we know, according to Scripture, talking about Acts 2, that the inauguration of this prophecy began at Pentecost, but has not yet, according to Scripture, been completed because those other signs have not occurred, we then have no biblical foundation to declare that the supernatural works of the Holy Spirit, which characterize the entirety of this prophecy, according to Scripture, have ceased before the full consummation of the prophecy. I know that's a little wordy. What I'm saying is this. If all of the details of the prophecy have not been completed, how can we say that the prophecy is fulfilled? It hasn't been fulfilled yet. Notice what Peter says also as he's quoting Joel. He ties in the back end of that prophecy to the coming of the Lord. Peter does it. So you've got Paul not as explicitly referencing it, Peter explicitly referencing it, but we're going to go back to Paul because Paul shared something with the church at Ephesus that he didn't share with Corinthians. And this should remove all doubt from any of us. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to share with you what Paul taught Ephesus about the need for spiritual gifts. And this is slightly different because now Paul is is bringing us spiritually gifted leaders or offices in the body of Christ. Inherent in these people that he's describing are the gifts that they exercise. And so we're reading this in Ephesians 4, 7. Grace was given to each of us, each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Skip down to verse number 11. You can read the whole thing in your Bible, but for time's sake. And he gave the apostles. Here are the gifts. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why did he give them? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, verse 13, until until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, until to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth, speaking the truth 
in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom? From Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds up itself in love. Verses 7 through 12 tell us why spiritually gifted people are needed in the body of Christ. Let's go back to the text. Why do we need these gifts? Why do we have them? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are not show and tell gifts. You know, when our kids are little, we go to show and tell with them. I had the occasion to do that. And they bring something to show And it's all about them for that moment. Look at my toy. Look at this thing that's cool. Look at this thing that's important to me. And then they tell what it means to them. Spiritual gifts aren't about you. They're not about, hey, give me the spotlight for a moment. I've got something to show you. That is a foreign uh, concept to scripture. Spiritual gifts, as we've already discussed, are intentionally given by God the Spirit. We have those gifts, not so people can say, wow, what a spiritual chick she is, or what an awesome powerhouse of a dude that is. That's not why we're given the gifts. We're given the gifts so that we can use them to build up other Christians, to advance the gospel. We employ them for the betterment and the building and the edifying of others. Now, let me just ask a question. Are we still to be doing that? Aren't we still supposed to be building one another up in the faith, building up the body of Christ, working together to advance the gospel, serving one another, esteeming one another better than ourselves, being like Jesus, Philippians 2, the kenosis, taking on the form of, of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, but he emptied himself and became obedient unto death. Aren't we still supposed to be the servants, the ministers building up? Well, the gifts were given for that purpose, all of the gifts. Now, it's very unfortunate that Corinth abused those gifts, but that's not the giver's fault, and it's not a problem with the gifts. The reason why Paul wrote the church at Corinth was to say, in part, you are really messing up something that was given for good. And in our day and age, we see that still going on. We see people that say they have this gift of the Holy Spirit or this gift of the Holy Spirit. And then time exposes that maybe they were deceitful. Maybe they were immoral. Maybe they were just theologically imploded in other areas. And we say to ourselves, if that is what that crowd that believes in the gifts is like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And then we add that to the reality that maybe we haven't experienced any of these supernatural gifts, and it simply is reasonable. It's a reasonable conclusion to say, I guess, I guess the gifts really aren't operative anymore. It may be reasonable, but that's not the question I'm asking. I'm asking you, is that what the Bible teaches? I, I think both sides of the aisle tend to make a strong foundation on their experience of the gifts or their lack of experience. I've had many people say to me, Well, Jeff, I've been saved decades, and I've never experienced that. And I, depending on who I'm talking to, at one point I I said, well, are you the only Christian? (laughs) It was a friend of mine. I can talk with him that way. I wouldn't talk that way in a, I was like, are you, okay, bravo. You haven't walked on water, but Peter did. You know, you didn't get caught up to the third heaven, but Paul did. There's a lot of things that we haven't experienced, but just because we haven't experienced it, that doesn't legitimize our ability to say it doesn't exist. I have to say this gently, but that's actually a very arrogant way to approach the Christian life by saying, if I haven't experienced it, it can't be true. And so when we're looking at this, we're seeing that spiritually gifted people are needed to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And he's, by the way, he's talking about leaders in this case, but it's not only leaders. Verse number 13, how long will spiritual gifts be needed? Because that's the question we're asking. Because, by the way, let me just say this. I'll do verse 13 and say, if the gifts are done, we are wasting our time here. I'm wasting your time. If if the gifts are non-operative, all of this is just theory, and it's striving about words to no profit, which the scriptures uh, actually forbid. But if it is true, and my position is clearly that it is, then a lot of people aren't using what God gave them. 
Now, if you think about the body of Christ today, well, actually, let's just, let me let the scriptures talk. Here we go. Verse 13. How long spiritual gifts will be needed until, there you go. That's a timing word. Until, timing is everything. We all attain to the unity of the faith. Real quick, has that happened? Y'all are afraid to answer honestly. Why are we having this discussion if it's already happened? The very fact I'm teaching on this shows us that we haven't all attained to the unity of the faith. And yet it says that these gifted individuals are given to the church. And I think we can uh, legitimately expand that to talk about all gifted people, but it's referring specifically to apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, but they are given until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And that hasn't happened. And to the unity of the knowledge of the son of God. Has that happened? To mature manhood. Is the, we're not talking about a couple of mature Christians over here. And, you know, we're, we, it's, a, it, it's a broad scope. It's, talking, it's encompassing the body of Christ until we, until the body of Christ is functioning in mature manhood, which is described as to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, even the most uh, optimistic guy in the room, our friend Dustin Pennington, who shared Wednesday night, and I'll say a few things about that before we leave today, um, about the next steps as we approach unification with Cornerstone. Dustin, I love being around him because he is the optimist. He, he sees the best, I need some of that, drip that on me, Lord, I need some optimism. He is the most optimistic guy I know, but even his optimism would not look at this verse that says that the giftedness continues until we, the body of Christ, reaches the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. Even the biggest optimist in the world wouldn't say that's occurred. Let me let my inner pessimist out a little bit. I look at the church today and I say, we aren't unified. I'm talking about the church big C. What, unified? Do you know how many Baptist denominations there are? Just Baptist. So Jeff, I'm, bless God, I was a Baptist. I was born a Baptist. I'm going to die a Baptist. Granddad was a Baptist. My question is now, okay, I get you, bro. What kind of Baptist? You're a Reformed Baptist, American Baptist, Independent Baptist? Were you a uh, full gospel Baptist? Were you a missionary Baptist? You see, all of a sudden, the words don't suffice. We've got denominations. Even the dom- denominations, you got Southern Baptist. You got, I mean, you, you, the denominations, the subcategories aren't even united. It just it keeps splintering everywhere. So I don't think we can say that we are unified in the faith. That's actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retract that. That's not pessimistic. That's true. We don't have unity of the faith. We don't have full knowledge of the Son of God. When's that going to happen? Face to face. When we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Mature manhood? I don't know. You think the body of Christ worldwide is spiritually mature? Are we, are we sacrificial? Or are we loving? Are we forgiving? Are we compassionate? Do we do the ways and the works of Jesus or do we just do something different? Listen, I'm, I'm not being overly pessimistic, but I'm also not going to pretty it up. And I just don't think that we can say that the church in any generation ever, I mean, Paul's writing at, in the first century. And he's writing to a jacked up church at Corinth. And then he's writing to a church at Ephesus where he's tell, having to tell them, hey, y'all don't get drunk. Be not drunk with wine. Instead of that, be filled with the Spirit. So, I mean, they weren't measuring up. We glamorize the first, oh, if I could only be a Christian in the first century. Most of us wouldn't, we we would recant because they, they burned Christians at the stake in the first century. They threw them in arenas with lions. So my point being in all of this, how long will the gifts be needed? Until, until, until these things occur. You match that up with what Peter said in the Day of Pentecost sermon that these signs have to take place. The the prophecy of Joel began, but it can't have ended yet because it's not complete. Everything in the prophecy hasn't happened. How can we say that that time which began completed without all the details of the prophecy being fulfilled? How can we do that? And then you have the very objective statements by Paul to the church at Ephesus that the giftedness that God puts in the church 
will continue until we reach the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, mature manhood to the stature of the fullness of Christ. And none of that's happened. So the until is still in play. That's my point. Brothers and sisters, that is, and I could go hours and hours, and your questions might generate more and more hours of dialogue. I understand that there is probably an unlikelihood of Jeff Lyle solving this issue for the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century. I know that's not going to happen, but I can tell you this, whereas once I was blind, now I see on this issue. My theology was changed before any experience of that theology came. I looked at my Bible and said, what I've been taught is not true. They were good people, by the way. But I didn't change my theology because I had some wild, inexplicable experience. I looked at my Bible and I said, my Bible doesn't teach what I have been taught. And I've been doing that my whole Christian life. I have enough of a maverick in me to say, I'm not going to take you at your word just because you think I should. I'm going to open my Bible just like the Bereans did, and I'm going to search the scriptures to see if these things are true. And when the scriptures say yes, I'm going to say yes. When the scriptures say no, I'm going to say no. And when the scriptures, and some of y'all won't like this because you're a type A personality, but when the scriptures leave some wobble room, I'm going to wobble. D.A. Carson is a five-point Calvinist. He takes his Bible seriously. He is skilled in Hebrew, Greek, New Testament theology, He's brilliant. I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that he would, uh, you know, sign off on, but he doesn't care. He is not losing any sleep because he doesn't know who I am. But he said this, and this is a guy who is as conservative as as theologians come, but he said this in his book, um, Showing the Spirit, which is a technical exposition of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. You ought to get it if you're technically minded. D.A. Carson, uh, Showing the Spirit. He said this, Scripture offers no shelter to those who wish to rule out all claims to charismatic gifts today. He just simply said this, you can avoid the truth, but you're not going to be able to find any shelter in the Bible. Now, I know that is confrontational, but I, I tell you this, I'm confronting with a goal in mind, not to get you to do something. Quite frankly, I do not care if you ever experience any of this supernatural stuff. That is not mine to say. But what I'm saying is this. We can only be empowered to the degree that we believe and trust God. And if God has decreed something and we choose not to believe it, we are cut off from the benefit that he has attached to that decree. So if these gifts are available and we are saying either individually or corporately or denominationally that they're not available, we are making denominational or or traditional decisions that literally outweigh the authority of Scripture in the way that we're promoting them. Jesus said once to a group of Pharisees, he said, you teach the doctrines of man like the commandments of God. Jesus didn't play with this. So in other words, the Pharisees were moral, upright, really conservative. They loved the Torah. They loved the law. They loved it so much they wanted to make it shine even brighter than God wanted it to shine. So they put their own little lights attaching to it, and they brought the people into a binding of tradition, and Jesus called them out. Not just there, but he called them out repeatedly. He says, you tithe on your mint and your cumin, but you ignore the more weightier matters of the law. We are to be known, watch me. Jesus did not say, by this they will know you are my disciples, that you speak in tongues. It's not what he said. 
They will know you that you are to my disciples by exercising prophetic gifting. It's not what he said. By preaching, proclaiming, by sacrificing, by serving. He never said that. Do you know what he said? Of course you know what he said. They'll know that you are mine when you love each other. When you live in love with each other, then they'll know that you belong to me. I want you to know my heart in this. I'm just going to, I'm going to pastor for a moment here. God is doing some incredible work, work that I don't completely understand what the finished product will look like here at Meadow. I do not fathom everything that the Lord is doing. Remember the verse I opened with John 13 earlier? What I am doing now, you do not understand, but you will understand afterwards. I'm living out a little bit of that. But I am going to be faithful to what I do understand. I hope that you and I can grow out of that place where we say, God, before I take one more step, I demand in the name of Jesus, you go full disclosure with me. He's obligated to none of us. What he has said is, I'll give you light for the next step. And when you take that step, you'll, you'll find light for the one that follows and so on and so on. And eventually, guess what happens? If you keep following the pathway that he's lighting up day by day, you're going to end up in the place where he's appointed. Amen. That's what faith is. So in these days where so much is going on in this assembly, I'm going to tell you a couple of things and I'm going to stop. This is to answer some questions that haven't been asked me, but have been asked. I'm not trying to turn Meadow Baptist Church into a charismatic movement church. I'm not. You will either believe me on that or you won't. I cannot affect your heart in that way. I have no agenda and never have to be a part of any movement. Movements originate with man and terminate with man. They're a waste of time. I am not looking to introduce some wild, chaotic vibe into our morning services. That's not my heart. For those of you that have been around Meadow a long time, I am employing the same principles I have always employed as your pastor. I am teaching the word of God verse by verse, and I'm asking you and I to answer the question, what do the scriptures actually say? It is my job, along with other leaders of this church, to determine direction for this assembly. And so what do I do? I wait on the Lord. I've got a lot of great ideas that never manifest here. You know why? God won't sign off on my great ideas because they're less than his ideas. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And so what do we do as a leadership group? We wait on the Lord. We've been waiting a long time. I've been waiting uncomfortably on the Lord to show me next steps for a few years now here. Last Sunday, I had the privilege of beginning to shepherd this church informationally at this point with the reality that God is leading me as your pastor in affirmation by your other elders and many other non-positioned leaders in this church to pursue unification with Cornerstone Church. Cornerstone is doing the same thing. Cornerstone has a history in traditional Assemblies of God background. Meadow has traditionally a history in independent Baptist fundamentalism. Brothers and sisters, what is the name of that church? Amy, what's the name of that church that pickets the funerals? Westboro Baptist Church is an independent fundamental Baptist church. Are we like them? Wouldn't you cringe to be lumped in with them? I'd protest it to the grave. I'd go picket their picketing, amen? (laughs) As we pursue unification with a church that was formerly assemblies of God, and they're leaving that, they're walking away, don't lump them in with all of those other types of believers that are associated with that kind of denominationalism. Don't do that. It's not only unkind, it's unfair. We need to leave denominational extremes and come to the place where God has called all of his people. That is in a New Testament faith rooted in apostolic doctrine, rooted in the Bible. 
And when the Bible defines our beliefs, it will also guide our behavior. And so I'm committing publicly to you today, I'm not trying to do anything except follow Jesus Christ. I will follow him. And in the spirit of the apostle Paul, who once said, as I imitate and I follow Jesus, I want you to imitate and follow me. This is what I'm saying. Let's get there together. And I promise you, the best days that we have ever seen as assembly are not behind us. They haven't happened yet. They're coming and God is calling us to go there. Would you stand to your feet this morning?